Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to be in the house. Uh, I was joking with Nick here, Nana. It's a little private joke. I said, Nick, if anyone runs up with a knife, you must just tackle them. But it's not funny. That's actually serious stuff. So no, folks, you know what? We pray for that church uh, in Sydney, but we pray all across the globe. I think uh, it's not easy to be a Christian anymore. It never has been, but we continue to pray for all churches. Amen. Can I get an amen? We honor the Lord. So, Nick, you must behave yourself, eh? No, Nick is good here. Listen, we have a guest here this morning, uh, all the way from Botswana, I've been informed. It is the AFM president of the AFM and uh, the deputy president. Uh, I hope I get your name right. It's Pastor Kusumile. Uh, we just want to honor you this morning. Let's give him a hand. You can stand. Great to have you. Great to have you. Amen. We are honored. We honor the Lord. Uh, can we, oh, so just about Super Sunday. So folks, it gets really cold up here in Gauteng in the winter. Uh, what a great opportunity it is to serve. You know, my heart is so warmed when I see so many people serving, serving in the house of God. That's the heart of Jesus. It's the spirit of the Lord uh, to serve. And so please put your name down. You say, you know what? I want to be part of that. For eight weeks, we're going to give people a lovely cup of hot soup. So there'll be physical food. But also beyond that, there will be spiritual food. In the coldest time of the year, what a blessing we can be. And, and that truly is the Lord working. That's the heart of the Lord. So please get involved in that. Are well, you ready? Let's get into the sermon this morning. Let's pray. Father God, this morning, we pray for each and every person in this church. That, Father, you prepare every heart. That, Lord, as Jesus taught in that parable, that as the seed is sown, every heart has soft soil. Not hard ground, not weeds, not rocks and stony places, but soft, soft ground, receptive to the Word of God. And then as the seed germinates, much righteous fruit will take place in their lives. Holy Spirit, help us. We pray this now in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. This morning, I didn't have the guts. I'm sorry. I've had the guts. I've played... Um, I played that song by Dire Straits, uh, Brothers in Arms. I played that with the lyrics. And, you know, we preached about the conflict in the Middle East. And I did not have the courage today to play this song. I'm going to read some excerpts out of it. The, uh, the title of the message today is called War. What is it good for? And it comes from a famous song by a man called Edwin Starr. I love this song. It's one of my favorite songs. Uh, it would have been made famous again uh, in the movie Rush Hour. And, and many people miss it. Because it's a, it's a real awesome song. It's really, it's, 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 it's really full of life. And you can hear the man who's singing it brings a lot of energy to it. But what many people don't know, that song that we all think is just part of a lovely action comedy is actually an anti-war song. You go listen to the words. It was written by, originally, I think the Temptations sung it originally. But in that song, they did not say, good God, you all. That's Edwin Starr. He kind of took the song to church. And it's a, a protest song against the Vietnam War. And I want to read some excerpts out of it. And then I want us to lead into what should our attitude to war be. And we're going to talk about some places. And uh, he sings the song. He says, war. Ha. Yeah. What is it good for? War I despise. Because it means destruction of innocent lives. War means tears to thousands of mothers' eyes. When their sons go off to fight and they lose their lives, it ain't nothing but a heartbreak, a war, friend only to the undertaker. A war, it's the enemy of all mankind. The thought of war blows my mind. War has caused unrest within the younger generation, induction, then destruction. Who wants to die? Oh, and, and the song goes on and on like that. And so it really is an anti-war song. And um, it's amazing that in the West and, and in the world that we live in, this, this bloodlust, we talk about lust, but there's also a bloodlust in the world. There's something faulty with the world. From that day when Cain murdered Abel, that was man's way. And it's been so ever since. And what should our response be to war? And I know, I know not everyone's going to agree with me, that's fine. But we have, to, we have to make business, and maybe that's the wrong word, 
here's what I want to say. We have to be serious with the words of Jesus. If you're a Christian, you will be weighed by his words. We are not here to be judged by politicians. We are not here to be judged by what generals and the ones who make war tell us and what the leaders of the world tell us. We are here to be judged by Jesus. Why? Because we're part of this church. Last time I looked, I saw he was Lord and Master of the church. Not the president, not a general of an army, not a political leader, but Jesus Christ. By the way, he's not a president. His title is King of all kings. Lord of all lords. And one of his names is the Prince of Peace. And so to his church ought to be a church of peace. And what should our response be? If we think of the war in Russia and Ukraine, the war in the Middle East, in Ethiopia, in Sudan, in the DRC. What should our response be as a church? Our response should always be sadness. We should be praying for peace because war is nuanced. You see, the people who start war will tell you that this side is evil and this side is good. But you know, life never works like that, hey? There are people on both sides that are good. There are people on both sides that are evil. Life is more nuanced than just saying us and them. You can always find people trying to push an agenda. But the attitude of the church, talking about us who serve Jesus, should always be one of sadness when we look at war. And, and war is the antithesis of goodness, love, and the primal intention of why God created man. God did not create man for war. Can I get an amen? God created man to prosper. God created man to multiply. God created man to flourish spiritually under his hand and to extend the kingdom of God through his life and your life. And do not be fooled by what people say. I was watching a documentary of Muhammad Ali who was protesting the Vietnam War. Do you know that they stripped him of his world title? He was not allowed to fly anywhere. They took away his passport just because he said, I'm not going to go and fight someone else's war. And today, if you look at what America achieved, and, and you can go through all wars and look at this. And they stripped him. They said, you may not for two or three years fly anywhere and box because you don't want to go fight. And he was on the right side of history. But what about us, the church? We should always have an attitude of sadness because sin takes its expression in warring between nations and, and even neighbors and family members. Never mind the wars that are taking place out there that you see on your television screens or your laptop screens or your cell phone screens because we all have an opinion, don't we, of how bad that is. What about the war that takes place in your family between friends, between father and mother, son and daughter? What about the war that rages in your heart? Never mind the war out there. And that's the war I'm going to talk to you about. Those wars that the media promotes are fake wars. I'm going to show you what the Bible says is the true war that you and I ought to be engaged in every day of our lives. And, and I find in today's church, there is too little preaching of the words of Jesus, the master of the church. These are his words. I hear no sermons. I hear sermons about why we must support this side and why we should support that side. And political agendas are being worked out in the church. But I hear no sermons of Matthew 5, 43 to 44. The most radical words for humanity that came out of the mouth of Jesus. Because we have a bloodlust. Here are the words. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. And do good to them that hate you. You know why those words don't make sense to us? Because we've been taught since Cain and Abel to have a bloodlust, to stand up for that son and say, they are right, they are evil, they are evil, they are good. But Jesus said, no, 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 no. I want you, the church, to love your enemy. You know why? Because that's how God loved you. Before you were born again, before everyone in this room knew Jesus, you were an enemy of God. And you know how he treated you? He loved you. While we were blasphemers and adulterers and idolaters of God, shaking our fist at God, God loved us. 
by sending his son to die for us. You know why God's good to you? Not because you are good, but because God himself is good. He loves you because he's good. And then he says, now that you're born again, you're going to learn how to love the way I love. I'm going to teach you a way that's so strange to human nature, sinful, fallen human nature. I'm going to teach you how to love. And Paul, in the book of Galatians and Romans and even Ephesians, tells us that there's a war going on. There's a real war going on. The one that the enemy wants you to focus on the wars that are taking place between mankind. But Paul says, wake up. There's a real war going on. One that is far greater and will determine where your soul ends up. You're part of that war every day. This is the true war. I want to say one more thing before I read scripture. Be very careful of any person, of any religion, whether they be Christian or any other religion, that will stand up here. And tell you to murder and kill in the name of God. There is a big problem with your theology. Jesus did not teach us to chop off heads or ears or arms or legs. He taught us to love. He taught us to forgive. Do you not think that Jesus has the power? He said, do you, I I willingly lay down my life. He says, can I not pray now for a legion of angels to destroy all of you? Do you not think I can do that? Never once does he use violence. The Lord of the universe, the master, comes to show us a better way. A way of love and forgiveness. And the world hates him. It's amazing you can sit at a table with people. You can talk about politics and corruption and crime and wrong things. And people will laugh and enjoy the conversation. Mention the word Jesus and people's thermostat pops. And they get upset and offended. Because of who he is and what he represents. Now Paul tells us about this war. The true war. Galatians 5, 16 to 18 in the New Living Translation. Also found in Romans and Ephesians. He says, so I say let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants you to do evil. Which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. The Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of the sinful nature. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. There you go. There's the war. So that you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under any obligation to the law of Moses. What is he saying? When you truly follow the Spirit of God, you won't want to sin. You won't want to sin. You'll, want to, you'll, you'll have a desire to do what is beautiful and just and edifying, that that builds people up. You will start to live the life that Christ has called you to. You see, when you're a sinner, and this is what many people don't understand, when you're a sinner and you've never received the gospel and given your heart to Jesus, you don't have a choice. All you do is you live in sin. You don't know there's a better way. Now that you're born again, there's the old way and the new way. And the new way is life. And the new way is hope. And the new way is blessed. But you've got to train yourself in living the way God has called you to. See, when you're a sinner, there's only one jacket to put on, so to speak, the jacket of sin. Paul uses this metaphor when he says, put on the new robe, the new nature of Christ. Put it on. Don't put on the old jacket. That man's dead. Put on the new jacket. And so what Paul is describing here is a war that is constantly raging. Does the Bible not say, so let me explain this to you. When you are born again, you are saved, and when you die, you'll go to heaven. But Paul writes about working out your salvation daily with fear and trembling. What does that mean? It means I'm born again, right? But I've got to work this thing out into my life. I want to live the way God's called me to live. I've got to work it out with fear and with trembling. What does it mean? A holy respect for God. Help me every day, God, to follow your ways. I want to become more and more like Jesus. I want to work this thing out in my life. I am born again. I am saved. I do love God, but I don't just want to have it in my heart. I want to see it in my actions. I want to see it in my mind. I want to see it in my mouth. I want to see it in the way I love, in the way I treat people, in the way I live. I want to become as Jesus is. Jesus became as we are so that we can become as he is. Can I get an amen? But wait, Paul goes further. 
Let me show you the fallacy and the lie of supporting warfare. Paul writes to the church in Ephesians. He says, I want you to wake up. I'm paraphrasing now. Recognize that everyone in this room is in a spiritual war. Not a physical war, a spiritual war. And listen to what Paul says. He says, Ephesians 6, 12, for your struggle. In other words, the Greek word, your warfare, is not against flesh and blood. Ah, it's not against flesh and blood. What does the media want us to focus on? What does the world want you to focus on? The physical war between flesh and blood. And Paul says, church, wake up. It's not about those things. You're in a war that has nothing to do with flesh and blood. Turn on any news media. You'll always hear about wars between flesh and blood. We get so worked up in who we support. And Paul says it's not even there. Your warfare is not there. He says, for your struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers against the authorities, and I'm going to tell you who those rulers are, against the powers of the dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly, heavenly realm. And that's what Paul's saying. Paul's saying every day that you wake up, there's a spiritual war for your soul. There's a spiritual war going on in the heavenly realms to take you off course, to keep you from serving God, to keep you from doing what God has called you to do. Every single one of us in this church. And he says, that's the true war. That's the real war. That's the one we ought to be focused on every day. To say, I want to become more and more and more and more like Jesus every day. And what does the world media do? They keep us busy, entertained with nonsense and focused on, on physical wars. And that's why I said to you, our response to that always ought to be sadness. Because people are being killed on both sides. There is brokenness happening on both sides. There is sin happening on both sides and we need to pray for peace and we need to show a better way and what is the better way and can I say this to you I want to say this to you I don't say we live in a perfect country but I want to say this to you South Africa has something to tell the world we have something to say the Americans think they know the Russians think they know you know that it took brave people to sit at a table and say enough killing Let's sit down. Let's talk. Do you know that Ireland, Ireland has something to say. For years, they were killing each other. They sat around a table and say, enough. Enough killing. Let's sit down and talk. There's a better way. We might not like each other. In fact, we might hate each other. But let's sit around a table because we have a bigger responsibility than just what we want. And they sat down and they spoke. There's something in that. Jesus shows us a better way. Jesus shows us a better way. The second thing, so number one, be aware that you're in a spiritual war every day. The second thing is to think, to keep fighting the good fight. 1 Timothy 6, 12, fight the good fight of faith, writes Paul to the church, to Timothy. He says, take hold of eternal life to which you were called when you were made. When you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses, Paul is saying, no, there's a fight. No, there's a fight. There's a fight for your soul. There's a fight every day for you to become more and more like God. And know that Paul is writing to a young man called Timothy, and he's saying, Timothy, understand, I want you to fight the good fight of faith. What is the good fight of faith? Keep praying. Keep seeking God. Keep repenting. Keep following the ways of God. Keep trusting Him to see a greater revelation of who He is in your life, to become more and more and more like Jesus. Every day you are busy with that fight, not a fight of guns and bullets and knives and weapons and missiles and bombs. No, 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 no. That fight is a temporal fight. It's a foolish fight. You don't believe me? Can I tell you a story? Sitting in a mother's house, sending off, I think, three of her sons to war in this country. You know what the, the government of the day gave her? They gave her medals. They gave her a flag. And they gave her a letter. 
Every day she sits alone in that house looking at photos of her sons. That's the reality of war. What does it mean? Those wars will come and go. But this war, where you end up on this side, will matter for eternity. And it's saying every day, Father, I'm going to pursue you. Part of the good fight is praying every day. Reading your Bible every day. Repenting of sin every day. Every day saying, Lord, I'm going to get better. I'm going to show you now how to do it. Trusting God to work in you. Saying, Lord, there is something greater that you want me to do. I'm going to become that man, that woman you have called me to become. I'm not going to focus only on what the world wants me to become. I'm going to focus on who you called me to be. And listen, how are we going to do it? There's a powerful scripture in Proverbs. King Solomon writes, and it's a foundational scripture if you understand spiritual warfare and you understand spiritual growth and you understand the spiritual life. Uh, King Solomon writes in Proverbs 4.23. He says to you, above all else, guard your heart. Guard your heart. For out of it flows the issues of life. Out of your heart flows the issues of of your life, everything you're struggling with, everything you fear, everything you hate, everything that breaks you down flows out of your heart, not God's heart, your heart. You've got to bring that heart before the Lord. You've got to say to the living God, Lord, reform this heart. If I live in fear, may I live in faith. Change my heart from a heart of fear. And you know how those lies creep into your heart, often through pain and brokenness and past experiences. There are people in this church, and uh, like you'll, you'll get some women in the church that have had some bad experiences with men. And when you talk to them about trusting God for a godly man, you know what they say? Pastor, you don't understand. All men are the devil. Why do they say that? Because it's in their heart. Past experiences have broken them. And then you get some men sitting in the church that have had some bad experiences with ladies. And you talk to them and you say, listen, so, so you, let's trust God that God's going to send you a good wife, someone that loves and trusts the Lord with you. And they say, pastor, all women are the devil. Where does that come? Out of their heart. Out of their heart. And it's about coming before the Lord and saying, reform my heart. Reform this place from which my life, the issues of my life flow out of my heart. May I become a man of faith, a woman of faith. Father, that temptation that I struggle with is in my heart. Reform my heart that I trust you more than that temptation, more than that brokenness, more than that habit, more than that fear. You know, there are people in South Africa right now that are saying, you know, the country's done and they, they, they're saying the 29th of May, you know, this is going to happen, that's going to happen. I want to talk to you as the church. I want to talk to you as the church. Let no politician form your heart. You do not belong to a politician. You belong to Jesus Christ. You do not belong to a general of a military. You belong to Jesus Christ. Let him form your heart. And don't believe what people say. Believe what God says. I want to even go further. Don't believe even pastors and prophets and apostles if it's not based on the Word of God and the Word that you understand and believe. Be careful of listening to prophecy that is some man's opinion. Some man's opinion. We had an American band. I told you the story. An American band that came and sang here a couple of years ago. And this American prophesied over South Africa. And he, he made some nonsense prediction. You've heard me say it about he sees a certain party and it had a certain flag. I don't even mention the flag's color because we're in that season of electioneering. And he said, and when that, that party comes to power, God's going to do a move. And then the two, the, the municipal elections happened and nothing happened. And I'm going to tell you something today. There's too much prophecy that's going on in the church that is not judged and measured in truth. Never once did that man say, I apologize for prophesying incorrectly. How many prophecies have gone out about the president of America and they never came to pass? Not one of those people stood up on the stage to say, I apologize. It was my opinion. When God speaks, it happens. You judge a prophecy by truth. 
Not by what someone thinks or says or feels. And you judge it by the Word of God. It's not my opinion, it's the Word that measures it. I tell you something, I believe this in my heart. We're in the best time in this nation. Do you know why? Hear me. We're desperate. We need God. I need Him. I don't know about you, I need God in this in this nation. I need God when I drive on the road. I need God when I go to work. I need God in my marriage. I need God when I raise my son. I need God and I'm not ashamed to say it. And it's a good place when we get on our knees and say, God, save us. Save us. It's a good day. It's a good day. I'd rather be here than in a place where we get everything we want and we're spiritually dead one of the things that Jesus said to the church. He said, you're so rich, but you're spiritually poor. Never stop trusting God. Here's the ways we're going to do it quickly. How are you going to change your heart? Write down a list of your challenges. Sin, unforgiveness, brokenness, bad habits. Take the number one thing. Take the number one thing. Pray about it. This is the second step. First one, make a list. Number two, take the number one thing. Pray about it. Give it to God. And then say, Lord, give me a plan. Give me a plan. I'm going to take this thing in my life. I'm going to change. It might take you a year. It might take you five. It might take you ten. It might take you twenty years. Whatever. You ask God. And then you find a confidence. you know what a confidence is? Someone you can pray with. Talk about your deep things. That it won't be the news in the church the next day. And one of the ways you have a confidence, just want to help you, is you share your heart. You allow them to share their heart you trust with God pray for each other every day in some cases you might need a fast number five you've got to keep at it there might be days you fall stand up and repent here's an idea here's an idea the word repentance means to turn around my life and go to God stop doing what is wrong pray and repent here's another idea how's about living a life of living repentance. See, we, we, we think it's, I just do one thing and I walk away. No, no, it's a lifestyle. Of coming before God and saying, Lord, have mercy on me. It's a lifestyle. Saying, God, I need you. God, keep me on the road. Every day I'm in relationship with you. I'm dependent on God. I'm trusting God. I'm holding on. I'm not just touching the hem of his garment. I'm holding on to the hem of that common. I'm embracing Christ. And it's a life of turning away from sin and death and turning to God and life in Jesus every day. A lifestyle. That's the true war. Not the wars of flesh and blood. That's the true war for you. Never let the enemy take your mind off this war and make you focus on those wars. Those wars will come and go and they'll mean nothing. But this war, this war will carry you into eternity until you see the face of Jesus face to face. And he embraces you and says, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's the true war. You and I fight that fight, the good fight of faith. Could you please stand to your feet? As we pray. I want to say two prayers for you. One prayer that God strengthens you in, in this fight. Father, we come before you as the church. Thank you that as we heard today in the worship, you will never, never, never leave us nor forsake us. May we have the same heart. Even if we fall, Father, the Bible says a righteous man may fall down six times, but he stands up the seventh time. May we have that attitude of we're not quitting. We're not giving in. We'll keep repenting. We'll keep standing up. We'll keep working that plan. We'll keep praying with confidence in our lives. We'll keep turning to the Lord, turning away from sin and death and start turning to Jesus every day. Father, strengthen your church. Bless this church. May our focus be on the true war, not these fake wars of flesh and blood that emanate out of greed and power. 
and selfishness and a bloodlust that people can have their own way. No, Lord, that's not your heart. Your heart is to bring the brokenhearted to you, the poor and the weak, that we may repent, that we may turn to God, that we may receive life. Bless your church, we pray. In Jesus' name, if you believe that for yourself, your family, your future, say amen. Now, one more prayer. Then I'm going to ask Charles to come up and take up the tithe and offering. Maybe you've entered this church today. You've heard the word Jesus or the name Jesus. You want to give your heart to the Lord. Bow your heads now. Nobody looking around. I want you just to raise your hand. Lift your hand up. Say, pray with me. Thank you for those hands. Thank you for that hand. You're giving your heart to the Lord right now. Thank you for that hand. I want us all to pray the sinner's prayer of repentance and the acceptance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray that together. Say, Father God, this morning, I give my heart to you. I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. He died on a cross, was buried in the grave. On the third day, He rose in the flesh. He is alive and well, praying for me now. Come live in my heart. I accept you. I repent of all sin. I need you, God. Wash me clean by His blood. I want to live for you from today into eternity. In Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. Hey, everyone. We hope that the word has inspired you and that you'll have a super blessed week. If you'd like to give into our church, we have four ways that you can give. The page is available on our website. And if you're physically in the area, we have church every single Sunday, 8.30, 9.45, and 11 o'clock in the morning. Then again in the evening at 5 p.m. in the main auditorium. That's for our Boxwood campus. We'll see you soon, church.